I'm Alexander Rose. I'm the executive director here at the Long Now Foundation. Um, it is really great to have you all in real life. Give yourself a round of applause for showing up. Thank you. Edward uh, or Ted Slingerland, um, he's spoken for us before, originally when he was at the Center for Advanced Behavioral Studies at Stanford. Since that time and, and around th and through pandemic started researching the basically the where where history where civilization and alcohol combine and, and his research was very much along the lines of when we started this place here at the interval of trying to figure out wh how civilization and drinking e tea coffee as well as as alcohols um, has really affected the way that we come together in a social space um, and he's his original training was in Chinese philosophy um, but he's presently uh, in the philosophy department at um, the University University of British Columbia, and I'd really love to welcome Edward Slingerland. Thanks, Edward. Cheers. All right. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> Rose. So people like to masturbate. They also like to eat Twinkies and do shots of Jägermeister. Not typically all at the same time, but. If you had a rough week, no one's going to judge. Um, what these otherwise disparate pleasures have in common is that from a scientific perspective, we've been told they're all evolutionary mistakes. So let's talk about masturbation. The orgasm is the best thing that can happen to you. Right? Evolution is reserving its biggest carrot, its biggest reward, for the behavior that it wants to reward the most, which is putting genes into the next generation. So this is tip, the, the adaptive target of the orgasm is reproductive sex. Human beings being very clever primates have figured out we can get this reward other ways. Right? <laughs> so this is a classic case of a brain hijack. So this is one type of evolutionary mistake where you are getting a reward that you're not supposed to get. You're, you're getting a reward. You're figuring out a way to trigger a reward circuit that shouldn't be triggered in the situation you're in. Evolution designed this very powerful uh, positive reinforcement device, and human beings have figured out how to game the system, and other animals as well, like little rats pushing a lever to get cocaine <laughs> injections. Evolution's probably kind of pissed off about this, but it, it's not going to bother with it very much because masturbation is a pretty low-cost behavior. It's low cost and it's also really not interfering at the end of the day with the main objective. We're still doing plenty of reproductive sex. Twinkies, junk food in general, is a different type of evolutionary mistake. I'm going to call this an evolutionary mismatch. So this is a case where there was an adaptive target, but it doesn't apply anymore. So for most of our evolutionary history, we, food was a problem. Acquiring enough food was a problem, especially sweet things and proteins, fatty types of things were a very patchy resource. So you get a lot of it all at once and then you get nothing for a long time. So individuals who had a sweet tooth and who liked fat and who would gorge on this stuff when they had it, had an advantage. This is a very adaptive trait, and for most of our evolutionary history, evolution is not going to care, not really be able to deal with this at all, because it's a very recent problem, and it's still pretty localized. So there's lots of places in the world where getting enough calories is still a challenge. So evolution is not going to worry about this mismatch problem too much in the case of junk food. Now, when it comes to alcohol, the Jägermeister shots, We've been told the standard story is that it's a brain hijack. That's the most dominant scientific theory about why we have a taste for alcohol. We figured out that consuming ethanol triggers this reward network in our brain, and like that little rat pushing the lever, we just keep doing it. That's the standard story. There are also various mismatch theories floating around out there that taste for alcohol allowed us to consume liquid in a safe form when uh, water was contaminated. There are se several different mismatch theories. What I want to argue tonight is none of these make sense. None of these can actually be an explanation for an evolutionary explanation for why we have a taste for alcohol. And that's because our taste for intoxication is ancient, costly, and dangerous. As, as long as we've had writing, people have been complaining about the dangers of alcohol, the dangers of alcoholism, the dangers of social chaos caused by excessive consumption. We find this in ancient Egypt, ancient China. In ancient Sumer, it's estimated that half the grain production went to producing beer. So they're taking half of their food and turning it into liquid neurotoxins. 
And as you notice, you know, kings had to decree that their subjects weren't allowed to make more beer than a certain amount because people want to turn it into beer. So very costly in terms of social consequences and also just uh, materially costly, economically costly. It's estimated that today, most households spend about a third of their food and beverage budget on alcohol. And that's almost certainly an underestimate because of black markets and underreporting. Um, and you may have not gotten the memo yet about masturbation. It doesn't make you go blind. <laughs> Don't worry about it. What does make you go blind is alcohol. Um, shots of Jägermeister can make you go blind. So it's very, alcohol is very damaging physiologically. It causes liver damage, it raises your cancer risk. From a medical perspective, there's really no upside to alcohol. And you can forget about all this the French paradox cholesterol stuff. It's, <laughs> it's bad for you. From a biomedical perspective, alcohol is bad for you. It's a dangerous substance. In the tiny country that I live in now, about the size of, of uh, California, 2014 is estimated that the economic impact of alcohol abuse was $14.6 billion. That's probably Canadian dollars. So that's like $10 US, but it's still a lot of money. Um, 14,800 deaths, 8,700 hospital admissions, all these years of productive life loss. This is a, if this is an evolutionary mistake, it's an incredibly costly evolutionary mistake. It's, it doesn't make sense that there would not be some pressure to fix this if all it was was a cost. Now, sometimes it is the case that evolution can't fix something. So evolution is constrained by certain conditions. So evolution can't act on a variant that doesn't exist. Selection pressure can't select for a genetic variation that isn't out in the world yet. So it's possible that our uh, taste for alcohol is a mistake, it's a very costly, ancient, dangerous one, but genetic evolution just hasn't churned out a variant yet that would fix the problem. That's one possibility. There are also various types of what's called path dependence, where evolution makes one decision and then it's kind of stuck. It has to keep going down that path. So that could be part of the story too. It's not. <laughs> Neither of those is possible in this case because there are genetic and cultural solutions to the problem of intoxication that evolution could have taken advantage of it if it wanted to. So let's talk about the genetic one first. There is a set of two different mutations in uh, enzymes that have to do with the processing of alcohol in the body that lead to a syndrome that's sometimes called Asian flushing uh, syndrome because it's most common in East Asia. If you have this syndrome, a couple sips of alcohol, you, your face turns red, you start to flush, you feel nauseous. Drinking alcohol is very unpleasant if you have this, this genetic condition. If alcohol were just a costly mistake, this is the solution to the problem. This is awesome. It's actually so effective at helping with drinking that a chemical that reproduces the effects of this genetic syndrome is used to treat alcoholism because you just don't like to drink. So there is this genetic solution out there, and it's an ancient one. So it's estimated that this evolved seven to 10,000 years ago, somewhere around present day Shanghai. But it just sits there. This is present distribution, focused around its origin, spread a little bit to Japan and Korea, but it's pretty much sat there. It's also very interesting that uh, analogous mutations causing the same effect have evolved at least twice independently, once in the Middle East and once in Europe, and also remain very confined to limited populations. So this is the silver bullet to the problem of our taste for alcohol, and yet it hasn't done anything. It hasn't spread very much. That suggests that there's, there's more to the story here than just some kind of evolutionary mistake. Let's talk about cultural evolution, which is very powerful. Cultural evolution can fix things very quickly. Um, it's very good at responding to new situations. How would cultural evolution deal with the problem of a mistaken taste for alcohol? Pretty easy, just tell people they can't drink. <laughs> Right? It's not, it's not rocket science. Um, so prohibition, we tend to think of prohibition in the American context. But again, anywhere there have been human beings who can write, we have records of prohibition. I mean, ancient China, one of the earliest law statutes that we have decrees death to anyone who makes or consumes alcohol. It 
it didn't work. <laughs> it was about as successful as American prohibition was. There are major world religions that are based on prohibition. One of their main uh, tenets is uh, abstaining from things that are intoxicating to the mind. So this, this solution culturally is out there. And yet, like that genetic solution, it just kind of sits there. So this is where alcohol is currently prohibited in, in part or in whole in the world. And it looks a lot like that genetic map. It, it didn't disappear. The solution maintains in our genetic and cultural repertoire, but it kind of sits there. It doesn't spread the way you would expect it to spread. If this was really only a problem, if there were only costs involved with alcohol, you would expect both this gene complex and this cultural idea of just prohibiting alcohol to spread very quickly, and it hasn't. So this is the puzzle. This is why uh, alcohol is puzzling to someone who looks at human behavior through an evolutionary lens. So we have these very real costs, social, physiological costs. We have both genetic and cultural evolutionary solutions to these costs that haven't taken off. The only conclusion you can come to if you're looking at this through an evolutionary lens is that there are benefits on the other side. There's something that is on the other side of the equation that's keeping our taste for alcohol both in our gene pool and in our cultural repertoires. So that's what we got to look at is what the benefits might be. What it can't, but the benefits can't be is pleasure or happiness. The answer can't be it makes us feel good because evolution doesn't care whether we feel good or not. The answer's got to be something adaptive, something in the currency that evolution works in. Um, so, so we have to think about what the potential adaptive benefits of alcohol are. To think about that, we have to think about our particular ecological niche. So human beings are primates, but we're really weird primates. Um, we're, we're very, our lifestyles and uh, everything about us is very different from our closest relatives. I wanna focus on two things in particular. One of them is our dependence on technology, tool sets, and therefore innovation. We are completely, human beings are completely dependent on technology. So much so that so one of the most ancient technologies is fire. We're so dependent on fire that our digestive system, our jaws, our teeth have changed. We actually can't consume raw food only anymore. We need it pre-digested by cooking. We're so dependent on this technology cooking that our bodies have changed to adapt to the technology. So humans are like this. We're, we're incredibly dependent on tools. If you're dependent on tools, you're dependent on creativity and innovation. The environment's constantly changing. You're having, you have to adapt your tool sets to new situations. You're competing with other cultural groups who maybe have better tool sets than you and can exploit the environment more effectively than you can. So, if you're using tools, if you're dependent on tools, you're dependent on creativity and innovation. So that's one part of our weird ecological niche, it's creativity. An interesting fact about human creativity is human adults are not very creative. Human children are. So Alison Gopnik, a psychologist at UC Berkeley, has done this great work with these very clever um, experiments where she's measuring lateral thinking. So a type of creativity where you need to have an insight. You can't kind of power your way through it through A, B, C reasoning. You have to see something new. And she has these very clever like, blicket detector experiments where she, she measures this. And what she's found is that actually four-year-olds are awesome at these tasks. They can detect these kind of counterintuitive things. And our ability to do so just decreases linearly um, with age as we, as we get older. Um, so we, by the time we're adults, we're, we're much worse at these kind of thinking outside the box tasks than four-year-olds are. Why is that? In the book, I actually lay this next to another graph, which is the maturation of a certain part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Um, so the, the villain here seems to be the prefrontal cortex. It's the last part of the brain to mature. It doesn't fully mature until we're in our 20s. And it seems to be part of the problem with creativity. So, so why is that? The prefrontal cortex is a very important part of the brain. It's very expensive. We wouldn't have it if it wasn't doing something important. It's the center of cognitive control. It's what allows us to uh, control our impulses, to um, focus on things. It allows us to uh, pursue a task and, and spend time on it, not to get distracted by other things. It's what allows us to delay gratification so we can resist temptations in the moment or laziness in the moment to do something that's more long-term. 
you need to have a fully functioning prefrontal cortex to be a successful adult. It's a really crucial part of our machinery. And yet, it seems to interfere with lateral thinking. And the idea is kind of the PFC allows you to focus, but by causing you to focus in a laser-like way, you're not, you're not seeing things in the periphery that children are constantly <laughs> distracted by, right? It drives you crazy when you're a grown-up. But that's what kids are constantly just seeing everything. And that's why they can't focus. We need to focus. So evolution's got this problem. We can't remain like children uh, our whole lives. We have to become adults. We have to be able to tie our shoes and get to school on time and, and do the things that adults do. But it comes at a cost. It comes at the cost of this, this kind of creativity we have when we're four-year-olds. What would be awesome is if we could remain adults with all the capabilities we have as adults, all the knowledge that we have as adults, but every once in a while, turn back the clock a bit and try to think like a four-year-old again. So to do that, you'd have to undo that maturation of the prefrontal cortex, at least temporarily. You could down-regulate it, for instance. So one way you could do this is a transcranial magnet, and people have, <laughs> people have done this. Um, you zap the prefrontal cortex with a magnet, take it offline temporarily, and people do better at lateral thinking tasks. They, they, get, they go back up to kind of where kids are in the performance on these tasks. So this is great. This shows you that the PFC is the problem, right? It's what's getting in, in, in the way of our creativity. The problem is this is a relatively recent technology. It's bulky. It's expensive. If you showed up at a party with this, <laughs> they wouldn't let you in, right? So what would be better than the transcranial magnet is a technology that's a little more subtle, lower tech. You can make it out of anything. It's easy to discover. It pairs well with food, maybe. <laughs> you see where I'm going. Um, alcohol is, is that technology. Alcohol is our low tech transcranial magnet that can take out the PFC. And so alcohol has a lot of different effects. Um, the, the journalist Stephen Brown has called it a, a pharmacological hand grenade. It just kind of goes in and starts hitting all the buttons at once. It's really, a, it's, a, it's a messy drug. Um, so it is in various timings and ways. It, it simulates the effects of meth and cocaine, Prozac, uh, Valium, Opium is doing all of these things and at various points as, you, as your BAC uh, increases. But crucially, and what's going to be crucial for the story I'm telling today, is that it depresses the prefrontal cortex. It depresses the motor cortex as well, which is why you shouldn't drive and you have trouble speaking at a certain point of inebriation. But crucially, it's down-regulating that, that part of our brain temporarily. And, and the nice thing is it does it gently, it does it predictably, and it does it with pretty um, uh, short uh, half-life. You, you recover very quickly. So it's, it's actually a, a brilliant technology for, for taking the PFC offline temporarily. And what does that give you? It gives you creativity. So this, there's this association you see across the world throughout history of creative types, artists, writers, poets, with alcohol. You see it in ancient China. You see it in, in the ancient Mideast. You see it in the present day. This is not a myth. There actually is a very good reason why alcohol is associated with creativity in artists. It's because it actually does make us more creative by downregulating the prefrontal cortex. Now, in terms of direct evidence of this, there's not a whole lot right now. Um, this is a nice study I like uh, by Michael Andrews looking at correlation. He's taking advantage, he's an economist, and he took advantage of this great natural experiment, American prohibition. So we tend to think of prohibition as something that happened all at once at the federal level. Just suddenly, no one in America could drink. And it wasn't like that at all. It actually took a really long time to impose prohibition, and it was imposed piecemeal at the county level. So he was able to look at county level data. And what he was looking at was patent applications as a, as a proxy for innovation. And he could look at patent applications at the county level. And what he saw is that when you impose prohibition on a county, patent applications plunge. Collective innovation plunges. And then it slowly recovers. It took about three years to get back to pre-prohibition levels. He, his hypothesis is speakeasies, <laughs> is, is why that happened. So basically, <laughs> prohibition comes in, you can't drink socially anymore, innovation goes down. 
And it goes down until people figure out a workaround. And the workaround was figuring out a new way to drink socially. So social drinking seems to be related to innovation, uh, group innovation in this sense. There's also one nice direct study that shows that, so this is a, actually not just correlational, it's causation, that if you take subjects and you give them a real alcoholic drink as opposed to a fake alcoholic drink, they're more creative. Um, and their creativity peaks at about 0.08. So that's about when you have a nice buzz on, when you shouldn't operate a motor vehicle. But that seems to be the spot where you still have enough cognitive control to actually think coherently and do things that are useful, but you've been loosened up. The, the hold of the PFC has been loosened upon you in a certain way. Um, so creativity is one of the really important functions of alcohol. Another strange thing about us compared to other primates is that we are communal we're dependent on other people in a way that no other primate is. And to get anything useful done, we need to trust one another. We need to engage in long-term cooperative tasks that require trust. And when we embark upon these tasks, we run into various types of cooperation dilemmas. And these go under different types of names, you prisoner's dilemma, tragedy of the commons. They have the same structure, though. You get the best payoff if you trust and you cooperate. The problem is, and this is a crucial part of the structure of these dilemmas, I don't know in advance whether or not you're gonna cooperate with me. And if you don't cooperate, if you defect, as economists put it, I'm screwed. <laughs> I get zero, you get a great payoff. And so for a rational, self-interested agent in a prisoner's dilemma game, the only strategy is to defect. So everyone defects and everybody gets that kind of bummer mutual defection outcome. In real life, people solve this all the time. We, we're constantly solving prisoners' dilemmas in our real life, and we do it because we're not rational, self-interested agents. We're emotional, um, and we use emotions to help us solve these dilemmas. We have emotions like honor, like loyalty, like uh, trust, that allow us, that bind us to each other in a certain way that prevent defections from happening. So emotions, the economist Robert Frank has a great book called uh, Passions Within Reason, where he explains that these love and honor and these things, they're approximately irrational. So in, in your actual psychology, they're not rational, but they have this kind of long-term rationality on an evolutionary scale. Um, so, so we use these emotions, and because emotions help us cooperate, we use them as cues to know who's a good cooperator and who's not. So when we're deciding whether or not to trust someone, we look at their emotional expressions. This is the safety net we have in cooperation. Um, I meet you and you genuinely are happy to meet you. How do I know you're, you're genuinely happy? Because you have that smile on the left and not the one on the right. The left one is a Duchenne smile, completely different muscle system, not under, typically under voluntary control. That's the smile you make when you're serving people in a restaurant or something. <laughs> you have to be nice to them. Um, we like the one on the left. We don't like the one on the right. So we use emotional displays as a way to know whether or not to trust people. This, this opens up this, this possible risk, though, that people could be faking it. The soft spot here, again, is the prefrontal cortex. In order to lie, in order to cheat, in order to calculate, you need your prefrontal cortex in top shape. Um, lying is very difficult cognitively, right? You have to keep in, tra in your mind both what's true and what's, what you're telling the person. You have to suppress emotions that have to do with the false thing that you're not telling them about. It's, it's real, you need your PFC in top shape. Um, what's also interesting is uh, when the PFC is in top shape, we're not as good at detecting lies. And this seems to be because we look at, when we're consciously focusing on detecting lies, we're not very good at it. We look at the wrong things. It's only when we're relaxed that we actually take in uh, more information. So let's target the prefrontal cortex. With what? With our good old friend, alcohol. <laughs> it down-regulates the prefrontal cortex. It makes, us hard, it makes it harder for us to lie. It makes it easier for us to detect lies. And it's also simultaneously boosting some hormones like serotonin that make us less likely to cheat. So it's, it's enhancing these kind of pro-social hormones in human beings. So this is why, um, you know, when, when people, potentially hostile adults, meet and have to come to some kind of agreement, they shake hands. And they're showing, I'm not carrying a weapon. When you meet with someone and you do a couple of shots, you're saying, I no longer have a prefrontal cortex. I am cognitively disarming 
and putting my prefrontal cortex on the table, you can trust me. This is why from ancient China to ancient Greece, alcohol is always at the center of uh, banquets, of treaty negotiations, anything where you have people with potentially differing interests having to agree on something. Um, all the way up to, you know, uh, Nixon told his Chinese counterpart, if we drank enough Mao Tai, we could do anything, right? <laughs> this idea that if we just disarm cognitively, we can solve these problems. And people use this informally all the time. So a cocktail party, a mixer, you're having to meet new people. You want to cognitively disarm. So we're simultaneously decreasing our inhibitions and increasing these kind of pro-social chemicals that help us like each other, like ourselves more and like each other's more. So alcohol plays this really important tool in helping people bond and helping people cooperate. This is also why when, when Skype was invented, remember back then, um, everyone predicted business travel would disappear, right? Why would you get on a plane and fly to Shanghai if you could just you know, Skype with these people to sign a contract? And yet people kept getting on planes and flying to Shanghai until the pandemic. It took a global pandemic to shut down business travel. And this is because if you're gonna enter into any kind of significant deal with another group of people, you wanna sit down and get drunk with them and eat a meal with them to get a sense of, of who they are for real. Um, so this is one of the important functions of alcohol. So in, in Drunk, I walk through these functional and important benefits of alcohol. But the important point is that you don't want to, admit, you don't want to lose sight of the cost of alcohol. It's a dangerous substance. It's estimated that up to 15% of the human population is prone to alcoholism. And if you have a tendency to alcoholism, you can't drink safely. Um, so it's a dangerous substance. It can lead to all sorts of chaos. But the taste for alcohol has been preserved in our species because there are these countervailing benefits. This is a carving that's 20,000 years old from southwest France. It's called the Venus of Lausanne. And she is holding up a drinking horn and throwing, throwing it back. It's not water. <laughs> this isn't direct evidence that people are drinking, but it's the earliest pretty strong indirect evidence that people are, are producing and consuming alcohol. People have been producing and consuming alcohol for as long as we've been doing anything in an organized way as a species. It's the old story used to be that we discovered agriculture and then kind of as a mistake, we stumbled upon alcohol. So we left the sourdough starter out for too long, it started to ferment, we tasted it and thought it was good. It looks like it's actually the other way around. So the so-called beer before bread hypothesis, which has been gaining in adherence and evidence argues that it was actually a taste for alcohol that drove us to start agriculture in the first place. And people who are advancing this idea look at things like this. So 20,000 years ago is way before agriculture. We also have sites like this one, Gobekli Tepe. So this is in uh, present day Turkey, 10 to 12,000 years ago. You have hunter gatherers, again, thousands of years before agriculture gathering together, creating this monumental religious architecture and having these massive banquets with, with huge amounts of wild game and then drinking something out of these huge vats that we've discovered. And we don't have chemical residues from these particular vats, but we know that people in the region were making beer. Um, they were making beer. We have direct evidence that's as old as 13,000 years ago from present day Israel. And often beer mixed with hallucinogens. So that's why you get carvings like this. Dan <laughs> Dancing turtles. You don't get that from drinking water, right? So it, this is the sense in which there's a, there's a literal direct sense in which intoxication has led to civilization. It's the desire to get intoxicated that caused human beings to start to settle down and live in agricultural communities. And you see this not just in the Fertile Crescent, but all over the world. Uh, the first cultivated plants seem to be chosen for their psychoactive properties, not for nutrition. So it really is this, this desire to alter our mind that caused us to settle down in societies for the, for the first point. So this is why you look at any culture around the world, there's alcohol. And if there's not alcohol, there's something functionally similar. So in places where they don't have alcohol, not many places in the world, but there are some, they have substances like kava, uh, cannabis, they have hallucinogen infused tobacco that are serving exactly the same functions. People are sitting down and consuming these things at banquets and 
and treaty meetings and, and points where the PFC needs to get downregulated and socially bonding hormones need to get upregulated. So, so there's a real sense in which uh, intoxication and civilization have been intertwined from the very beginning. So I want to talk a little bit about the dangers of alcohol as well. The, the gift of Dionysus is an important one, but we have to see that they sometimes aren't what they seemed at first. For all of the functions that I, I talk about in the book, the social bonding, uh, reducing inhibitions, there are dark sides as well. Um, tribalism, um, people being disinhibited who really shouldn't be disinhibited. <laughs> you would like to be using their prefrontal cortex a bit more. Happy sociality can, can very quickly turn into violence and aggression. And that's why alcohol is implicated in domestic violence and all sorts of, of really um, negative consequences for society. So alcohol is dangerous. We also have to keep in mind that it's more dangerous now than it's ever been. If we want to think in long now ways about the big picture, we, at right now at this moment, we're at a very dangerous point with our relationship with alcohol. And that's because alcohol has always come with two safety features that have recently been disabled. So one of them is the natural limits on the strength of alcoholic beverages. If you're using natural fermentation, alcohol can only get so strong. Very, very recently, again, in the long view, humans figured out to make, how to make this stuff, distilled liquor. This stuff is so powerful, it really should be considered a different drug. It's, it, you can get up to like 90 something ABV with distillation. So it's still ethanol, but it's at a level, just a dosage that we are not built to deal with. So this is a dangerous thing and it's very recent. So our history with alcohol goes back at least 10 million years when our primate ancestors adapted to eating fruit that contained some alcohol. Here's modern humans emerging 200,000 years ago. Certainly by 12,000 years ago, we were making beer and maybe wines. That's when distillation happens, a few hundred years ago. And that sounds like a long time ago. You know, 1600 sounds like a long time ago. It's a blink of an eye and on the time scale we're talking about. We just haven't had time to adapt to this, this new, very dangerous drug. Another safety feature that alcohol has always come with is social drinking. Historically, private access to alcohol was unheard of. If you wanted to drink alcohol, you were drinking it socially, communally. There are often taboos against drinking alcohol in your own residence. You had to drink it publicly. In ancient Greece, the, the symposium, the, the wine uh, gathering, was run by a symposiarch who controlled the consumption of the alcohol. They would, they would mix the water and wine. They'd make it stronger or weaker, depending on how drunk people seemed. And you only drank when it got passed around. In ancient China, and actually today in China, you don't drink at will. You drink when someone makes a toast. So when someone makes a toast, you say ganbei and you drink, and then you have to wait until someone makes a toast again before you drink again. It's a very powerful way to control people's drinking levels. Even in very informal situations, so you think of yourself out with your friends at a pub or at a dinner party, Social control is very powerful. At a pub, you, you finish your beer and you want another one, you have to wait until your friends finish, because you're going to order another round. If you're drinking too fast, the cocktail server doesn't make eye contact with you. <laughs> you can't order another drink. I start helping myself to wine a little bit too liberally at dinner, and my mother-in-law gives me a dirty look from across the table. <laughs> right? We have all these ways of socially regulating alcohol consumption, and this is a safety feature. It's actually part of how we've used alcohol. All of this goes out the door when you have drive through liquor stores. You can go through a drive through liquor store and load up your SUV with enough liquor to kill a medium-sized village and just take it home. It's, this is evolutionarily unprecedented and it's dangerous. And of course, COVID made this so much worse. Lockdowns made uh, drinking at home pathological. And I think a lot of us are still actually recovering from that because alcohol is incredibly physically addictive. Once you up your uptake, it's really hard to, to tile it down again. So one take home message from the book is beware of distilled liquors and don't, don't drink alone. Drinking alone is really dangerous. Now that COVID lockdowns are down, we're all we're meeting in person here. We're all drinking actually in public. There's a, there's a bartender who can look at you and go, no, I'm not going to give you another drink. Take advantage of that. Drink. One way to, to mitigate the potential harms of alcohol is to drink out with other people in public. So Dionysus was worshiped by the Greeks as a god. He, he gave these very important gifts. They viewed him with caution as well. 
And that's very important. We have to be cautious about this, this enabler of civilization. But the fact that intoxication and civilization have been tied together so tightly for so long gives us some sense of why all cultures that I know of have made a place for ecstasy and intoxication in people's personal lives and in their social lives. And this is how we can continue, I think, to thrive as the strangest primate in the world, but also the most effective. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. That was really great. This question of, of whether or not this is a hijack or a mismatch or an evolutionary mistake, I think is a, it's an interesting one. So you're, you're calling out both the mismatch and the hijacking, yes? Yeah, I think they're both wrong. And you just think it's just a plain old mistake and we're just too, we're too shortly into it to have adapted? So I think they're both wrong because the costs are so high that it doesn't make sense that this mistake would be allowed to stand by evolution. There'd be so much pressure to fix it and yet it hasn't been fixed, right? Even though we have these solutions. And I mean, there's a curious thing about this drug is that it's, um, I mean, it's gone in and out of legality in many countries, including ours, but I mean, there's, you know, there's clearly, there's other psychoactives that, um, that in some cases, I mean, people can argue are better or worse. I mean, it's very rare that someone gets, you know, stoned on cannabis and beats their family, whereas they will do this on alcohol. Um, I mean, what's your take on, you know, the alcohol substitutes of the world? Yeah, so in the book, I do discuss other intoxicants, and I argue that there's a reason that alcohol is the, I call it the king of intoxicants. If you gave an engineering, a cultural engineering team the task of coming up with a substance and you gave them design specs, we want it to be easy to make out of it. Anything, it should have predictable effects, short half-life, predictable across individuals. They would probably come up with alcohol. Um, so if you look at cannabis, cannabis has advantages. Um, it doesn't lead to violence. Um, it's not physically addictive. It's possibly psychologically addictive, but not physically. Um, it's physiologically less harmful than alcohol, but it has wildly varying effects on individuals. So I have friends, I had friends in grad school here in the Bay Area who would smoke and then go out dancing, which is inconceivable to me. So when I smoke cannabis, I get really paranoid and then I fall asleep. So it's not a social drug for me. You can't, your, your social go-to drug can't be something that has such variable effects on people. And it's also um, hard to dose. If you don't know how to hold it in your lungs, you don't get the same dose. Whereas when we're all sipping that beer or the Georgian wine, we know what we're getting and we know, and it gets cleared from our body very quickly because we have this machinery that's 10 million years old to grab that ethanol, break it down and get it out of our bodies as quickly as possible. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting. I, mean, I, I have noticed that, you know, certainly as cannabis has become legalized, that the ability to dose it more regular, you know, it used to be like you just got pot from your dealer, yeah, which is you pot. You had no idea what right? it was. And yeah. so now you can yeah. go to the store and it's like going to the Apple store and you yeah. like tell them that you like long walks on the beach and you want to go to sleep when you take it and they yeah. like, they like give you yeah. some nice edible gummy and, and it's yeah. a very different thing. So in some ways, maybe possibly the legality of things can make them vastly more predictable and yeah, more tunable. But it's, yeah, it's still individual variation. I've gone to cannabis shops and they've said, this will make you want to dance. Oh, you just had the wrong strains. You've been having something that's too much indica. You need more sativa. And I'm like, all right, I'll try that. And I get really paranoid and I fall asleep. So <laughs> I, there, there just is, it just is the case that that drug, the way it impacts your brain, there's a lot more individual variation. I talk about psychedelics in the book. Psychedelics, the problem with them is they're so powerful, right? If we were all doing mushrooms, this would be a very different scene right now, <laughs> right? We just don't do that um, because they really powerfully dissociate you from reality if you could actually dose them in a different way, so you can separate the active component, you can put it in a little capsule, maybe it could actually be used the way that alcohol is used. Um, but our history with microdosing is 10 years old, and our history with alcohol is at least 20,000, probably a lot longer. So um, I like the tried and true technology. Yeah. Well, I thought it was really interesting, this idea of, of booze as both the, the truth maker and the and the lie detector. And I think we've all experienced, you know, in some cases, maybe people giving too much truth when they're intoxicated. <laughs> yeah. um, and, then, like, and then yeah. also people realizing someone's lying 
when they're intoxicated uh, and maybe kind of that kind of breaks the social contract uh, in some ways as well. I mean, like the office Christmas party that yeah. you know, things go too far, right, is, is, this, is this thing. And so I think that's a, it's an interesting paradox. It can both help, help a social contract and also hurt the social contract. It can hurt it, though, in ways that are helpful because often what that's bringing to the surface is tensions that were really there. Um, so it can help you actually break out of kind of unhealthy relationships or uh, supposedly cooperative relationships that are, are not really cooperative. Right. But it, I think it's sometimes for, on the office party problem, it's like maybe you want to hold those things yeah. at bay. In Jim in accounting should probably yes. not <laughs> tell the CEO what he really thinks about his new car. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that you point out some of the, the civilizations that have, have developed the social, different types of social contract around alcohol. The Asian cultures, like, I mean, in Japan, like, you never pour your own drink. Mm -hmm. you, somebody else pours it for you. And however, I've never really seen that as a limiting factor in that Japanese culture. <laughs> but, yeah. but I mean, I think that may have been what it was about. Yeah. Um, and even the term bar came from barring you from getting to, it was a bar originally, <laughs> just to stop <laughs> you, you from, from getting to the alcohol, alcohol whenever you want. So uh, um, can you say a little bit more about this this part of the social contract? Well, this is how, I mean, we're, we're clever, we're a clever species. So we have this substance that's useful, but it's dangerous. And so we come up with strategies to mitigate its harm. And one of those strategies is always drink socially. And, and social drinking in most cultures is so surrounded with, with ritual and all sorts of regulations. Um, it's really, it's a safety feature. It allows you to consume it. If you as an individual, so when I was coming home from going to the States during COVID lockdowns and I was you know, in my apartment for two weeks and I could call up my local taqueria and get, you know, some carne asada delivered and also as much tequila as I wanted. <laughs> That's really dangerous. If you're asking me as an individual alone in my apartment to regulate my alcohol consumption, I wouldn't put a, I wouldn't bet on me. Um, but if I'm out in public with my friends and my family and we're drinking together and people are regulating me in both conscious and unconscious ways, that helps. So the, the humans have developed this kind of social safety net to help us consume alcohol safely. And that's why I think that this, this trend toward drinking alone, you know, kind of suburban American life where you, instead of going to the pub after work as you would in Europe or the cafe, where there's kids, there's old people, everyone's there, everyone's drinking moderately. You go home and you have access to your liquor cabinet and as much wine as you want. Um, we're not designed for that. Right. That's the mistake part. That's the mistake. Yeah. 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 That was never, never part of the plan evolutionarily. Yeah. And I mean, and, and speaking of that, and, and so this will be the last question I asked before going to the audience here for some questions. Um, so please raise your hand um, and we'll get a mic to you. But um, I think one of the things that, and I remember Lance, the head distiller at St. George, who made these spirits for us, um, that he, you know, he looks at distillation as effectively, you know, preserving a moment in time um, and a, you know, a particular um, bill of of ingredients that can then last effectively in perpetuity. And I think clearly there was some part of, of using alcohol as a preservation of calories. Like you can't, mm -hmm. you know, they couldn't preserve grain without refrigeration and other things all the way through all their winter. So actually, if you, if at least it's part of your calorie intake, mm -hmm. it's a way of, of of getting calories all the way uh, through preservation, not just for the drinking part, yeah? Absolutely, so you know, I dismiss the mismatch theories because I don't think any of them can be the whole story, but they could be part of the story. So there's um, the biological ennoblement argument that when you take grain and ferment it into beer, you're adding micronutrients. And that's probably one of the explanations why people living in, let's say, ancient Egypt could live on these incredibly monotonous diets. So they're moving from being hunter-gatherers where they had meat and vegetables and all the fruit, and now they're just eating bread. That's all they have is bread and water and beer. And so beer is giving them these really crucial micronutrients that help. Um, and as you said, you, know, there's a, you have this excess harvest. You need to store it somehow. Um, beer and wine are good ways to do that. Distillation is an awesome way to do it because it lasts for so much longer. And was that also a way that people used to, in some way, um, fight their own microbial battle within their, with the food that they ate? Yeah, so there's the, when you ferment, if you take water that's contaminated and you ferment it, it becomes potable. 
So the, the dirty water hypothesis, as I, I call it in the book, has certainly got, got to be part of the story. Um, but the, the problem with that as a sole explanation is that a lot of cultures that um, drink alcoholic beverages mix it with raw, untreated water, or they drink both. Um, or you have cultures like China where, so if the problem is dirty water, boil it. And China has had tea and this kind of taboo against drinking unboiled water for as long as we know. And yet they're still drinking lots of alcohol. So that can't be the only part of the story. But I think a lot of these mismatch hypotheses are feeding into the other kind of social function. Right. They can be yes and, not exclusive. Yeah. 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 Do we have a question? Anyone? Given the relationship, the, the long-term relationship with us and alcohol, I was wondering your thought on like, has evolution done the ROI analysis and realized alcohol is worth it? I think so, because it both genetically and culturally, it was given an out, <laughs> and it didn't take the out. So I, I really think that the fact that we have these solutions that have not spread, that have not reached fixation, but still hang around, which is interesting in itself, um, suggests that there, have to, there has to be countervailing positive benefits. I mean, of course, we're talking um, in the talk, and now we're, we're giving intentionality to evolution, right? It's a blind process. That, but it's, it's the intentional language is a helpful compression. It's good for humans to, to reason with. And so, yeah, I think you know, evolution basically was, has been aware of the cost, but has also been a, t not taken, not made everyone have Asian flushing syndrome, which is what it would have done if it was all costs and no benefits. Interesting. Yes. So other, other animals, lots of them besides people, drink alcohol. We've all seen pictures of drunk elephants. Yeah. I've watched wasps going after downed fruit, having trouble flying afterwards and running yeah. into things. Yeah. So how, how do you feel about the extent to which this is not really limited to peculiar apes? Yeah. So it, biologically, ethanol is a kind of pleasure lock. It makes lots of organisms feel good, not just humans. What's different about humans is we actually make alcohol and use it consciously. <laughs> Elephants are not brewing things, right? Um, so that's what's, what's distinctive about human beings is other, and, and other species discover this typically through us. So the, um, the, the myths about like um, elephants getting drunk on wild fermenting fruit Someone did a study just with the body weight of an elephant, like how much fermented fruit you would need. And it's like a, a football stadium full of fruit. It's just not possible. If they're drunken elephants, they've broken into distilled liquors that humans have made. Um, so we're the ones who make this stuff and make it available on a, on a intent, in an intense way and on, in a widespread way and consciously as a tool. Interesting. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah, you mentioned that um, we're sort of at like the most dangerous part of, in history. And I was just thinking about like, do you think that it's going to continually get more dangerous or less dangerous and why? It may get less dangerous if we discover that microdosing gives us all the benefits and none of the costs. Um, it might be less dangerous if we just consciously if we're aware of what the dangers are, we can design social mechanisms that will help us. Um, so we have, you know, humans have some control over this. But I think that the problem is we've been, when it comes to alcohol, we've been flying blind. It's just been like, oh, it's this thing, fun thing we do, evolutionary mistake, but whatever, we enjoy it. Um, when we when we have that kind of muddled way of thinking about alcohol, it's hard to make intelligent decisions. I think if we understand what it's good for, so what are the functions that it serves, and we understand what the dangers are, so what happens when those functions go over to the dark sides um, when we're using distilled liquors or we're, we're blowing past 0.08 BAC too fast. We can design um, both alcohols and, and social mechanisms to help us. And I think I'm optimistic about humans. I think we're, we're pretty good at figuring this stuff out. So, I mean, you see this in, in, in the craft beer industry. 
you know, there's a long period where they're just pushing for ABV, ABV, like making these like 12% ABV beers. Um, and a lot of them have pulled back and realized, you know what, actually the reason people want to drink beer is they want to sit with their friends and drink and watch the game or chat. And to do that in a way that's pleasurable, you want a 2 to 3% session ale. Um, so we've, all, we've been able to kind of um, de-escalate <laughs> when we realize that it's not helpful. And so I think that, um, but the crucial thing is just knowing, having a clearer view of it. And I think to have a clearer view of it, we need to know our history, we need to know our science, and we need to look at it all through an evolutionary lens and, and a kind of long now lens, look at it on a, on a large time scale. Yeah, and if any of you want to taste some of these early um, uh, kind of recipes. Um, there's Patrick McGovern, which is one of the people that you consulted, a biomolecular archaeologist whose who's main thing that he does is that whenever they discover some tomb where there's a burial that has like urns and things like that, he gets the scrapings of that urn and he puts that through analysis and figures out what was in it. And then he then Tried works to with- make it. <laughs> yeah, and then he works with, uh, with Dogfish Head Brewery to create this ancient ales collection. And one of them is the Jiahu, that's yeah. an 8,000 year old recipe from Asia. One of them is Midas Touch, which is one that we used to serve on, on uh, tap here. Um, it's a very mead-like one, but I would, I would highly recommend it. It's a great way to take a tour of some of the oldest uh, recipes on the planet. They make very limited runs of them, but they do it every year, and you, there's a whole collection, so I, I would recommend that. I, I guess the, the, my question is, like, if we're talking about evolution and alcohol, is do you think that there's going to be a time when we, like, if, it's, if it has this benefit, um, do you think there's going to be a time when we either evolutionarily or through genetic engineering you know, basically develop better livers and cancer resistance for the, the <laughs> negative sides. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's happened. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's actually ongoing. There's also, there's a interesting hypothesis that, um, so distillation first happened in China. It happened several hundred years before Europe. And I do have some colleagues who feel like the Asian flushing syndrome is a so it hung around for a really long time for other adaptive reasons, but it's now expanding to Japan and other places because it's a response to distillation. Right. That was in the rice wines, the early rice wines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were distilling quite early, yeah. uh, make it sorghum liquors. Um, yeah. So it's possible that you know maybe that that genetic syndrome will spread because maybe alcohol has become too dangerous and we need to flush and feel heart palpitations when we have any of it. Right. But so we can, you know, this evolution keeps. They could be the, the first, the first sign of that evolutionary reaction. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was really yeah, great thanks. to have you. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Thanks.